Hey everyone, this is lecture 12.1. This time we will be talking about emerging issues uh, in the area of uh, crime public policy and the criminal justice system. So, um, in the first part of this lecture, I'll be briefly addressing the now what uh, of this lecture. This is, the, um, if not the last, then one of the final uh, lectures to this course. And that brings up some questions. Uh, then we will talk about emerging issues, including issues surrounding children and teens, issues surrounding gun control, issues surrounding the right to privacy, and technological issues. So by this point in the course, you should have a basic understanding of how the criminal justice system and its policy works. Uh, even if you don't understand the entire system, you have at, le at least some examples under your belt. Uh, we've looked at some things and you have an idea as to how the system would uh, talk about certain issues. So now this week uh, is the time to ask, uh, how has this course changed the way that you vi view the criminal justice system? And maybe if this is the first social course you've taken a while, taken in a while, or maybe if this is the only social course you've ever taken, uh, you can ask how has this course um, helped uh, shape how you view other social systems as well? Um, I like to have this kind of reflection at the end of a course, uh, just you know, so that you can develop your takeaways for the course. Because I do, you know, it's more than just a grade. I want you to actually be able to take some life experience away from any given course that you take. So how will you, you can think about how will you use this information uh, in your career? This, uh, this is especially prevalent if you are someone that is going to be involved with the criminal justice system. Uh, we can all ask ourselves, how can we use this material to make the world a better place? How can you use this material uh, to be a more informed social actor? So uh, how can you use it uh, in your personal advocacy work? How can you use it in your relationships with other people? How can you use it uh, if you should ever meet someone who is a former inmate, right? Or, you know, will you just ignore it? really look boldly in, in the face of the material and say, yeah, I'm not going to do anything about this. Uh, this lecture today is focused on uh, the modern world stances and how they may change in the near future. So what we're doing is we're talking about how things exist here and now and uh, how we may expect those things to change in the, in the immediate future. So first, let's talk about issues surrounding children and teens. So since the time that we started to consider children as actually having different needs than adults, and that was only in the mid 1800s, um, the treatment of children in the criminal justice system has, become, has continued to be controversial. And these issues remain controversial and these issues remain relevant surrounding of children in the criminal justice system. One major way uh, that children are sometimes treated or mistreated in the criminal justice system is the use of zero tolerance policies. These are policies that focus on, on the reduction of drug abuse and violence in schools. That is the intention of zero tolerance policies. However, these policies require the punishment for any refraction. So the maximum punishment for any infraction, regardless of uh, severity. And whether the actual action was an accident or a mistake, or um, whether the person absolutely did it maliciously on purpose, uh, a zero tolerance policy will punish everyone as severely as it possibly can. And I brought up earlier in the course the punishing of uh, the young boy in the mid-1990s for dressing up as a firefighter and bringing a toy axe to school. And he was punished as if he had brought a gun to school and had intended to shoot people, right? That's obviously 
a dramatic misuse of the policy, but because it was a zero tolerance policy and because it was worded in a certain way, the administrators had no choice but to do it. Um, I am reminded of a friend of mine in my high school growing up. I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, as you're very aware. Um, we have a heavy hunting culture, deer hunting culture in Western Pennsylvania. And he, my friend had gone hunting over the weekend and he still had his buck knife in his pocket, which a uh, buck knife is a large, very sharp knife. And once he got to school, he realized he had that in his pocket. And he went to our principal, who was a very good and a very fair man. And he said, listen, I know I'm not supposed to have this, but I, here it is. And uh, to his credit, Mr. Wolf ignored the zero tol tolerance policy. So he, he did break the rules and he could have potentially gotten in trouble for this, but he knew that this uh, young man uh, did not intend to hurt anyone by doing this. And so he took the knife and I believe uh, after school he gave it back, right? Uh, that is probably more of the nuance uh, that most of us would like to see in our high, in our schools and our high schools. Uh, but um, unfortunately, uh, due to zero tolerance policies, that's not always possible. Uh, another series of issues uh, surrounding children or teens is the judicial philosophy of parents patre which uh, in which the state assumes responsibility for wayward children or children in trouble or whatever they want to be called uh, to be removed from their parents care and place them in institutions under the guise of acting in the best interest of the child now parents patry type laws and policies have definitely helped many many children so children whose parents have been abusing them children who um, are in really bad, dangerous situations. But some very horrible things have also happened because of parents' patry um, use. Uh, immediately, the first thing I think of when I think about this is uh, the abduction of Native American children from their parents in the 1800s uh, because those parents were seen as being unfit. Um, there are There's a lot of um, real ugly things that can happen in the name of finding parents unfit. Now, given there are definitely some parents who are absolutely unfit, uh, but uh, policy, uh, people who exert policy, people who make policy need to be very, very careful when they are trying to consider whether a parent is fit or unfit to keep from, you know, really horrible things. Because the last thing I think most of us want to do is separate children from their parents. But at times it is necessary. Uh, it should be noted, this may be immediately relevant to your life, that some colleges have been known to enact the concept of parents patry when um, forming policy for students. Um, this is especially common in smaller private institutions, ones that aren't so much like UNM. Uh, but uh, they will often uh, pass rules under the expectation that they are, um, the, the institution itself is responsible for uh, the well-being of the quote-unquote child. Now, that's uh, messed up by a lot, by the fact that most people who are going to college are already over the age of 18, um, and that's a really, it's, it's, deeply problematic, but there certainly are some institutions that have attempted to uh, use that justification in how they treat students. Here are some important Supreme Court decisions surrounding uh, the treatment of children and teens in by the juvenile justice system. The first is Stanford versus the state of Kentucky. Uh, this occurred in 1989. Uh, this prohibited the death penalty for youth under the age of 16. So no matter what the 16 year old or younger did, that then the death penalty uh, could not be used in that situation. Uh, Roper v. Simmons in 2005 further uh, took the next step by abos abolishing the juvenile death penalty. And a lot of that is, uh, and all three of these actually, Miller v. Alabama in 2012, 
uh, held that the use of mandatory life without the possibility of parole for juveniles is unconstitutional. These are all based on relatively uh, modern social scientific concepts, uh, namely um, psychological, biological concepts that the human brain is not fully developed by the age, until the age of about 25. Uh, so some of you listening to this might be listening with not fully developed brains, and that's just fine. It's not your fault. Um, the fact of the matter is, though, that our decision-making capacity is certainly less uh, when we're under the age of 18. So we really can't be held as fully 100% completely uh, responsible for our actions. We can be held very responsible, right? We can be put in prison. We can be put in prison for 40 years, but it was ruled unconstitutional that you can't be executed and you can't be put in a position when you will be never be let out of prison. Um, so it's, it's still holding teens responsible. It's just holding them a little smidgen uh, less responsible, um, which you know, it, it, it's humane in the long run. So a few issues surrounding gun control. This is possibly a one of the most controversial topics in our society as it exists. Um, controversy over gun control is only getting greater. Um, so, uh, so gun policy has a high impact on uh, public res to high profile incidents. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, gun policy uh, tends to change when uh, very visible uh, instances of mass shootings occur. And I put supposedly there because there are many, many shootings that occur, it seems like all the time, that don't necessarily get that high profile attention. Uh, so what I'm saying here is that in the past, uh, gun policy has been um, really swayed by high profile events, but it appears that there may be a tendency toward gun policy not really being swayed by high profile events. And then what does that mean for our future? Um, it's an interesting set of deeply troubling questions. Uh, universal background checks. This is something that we talk about surrounding gun policy, and actually 90% of all Americans do favor universal background checks. So they do favor um, seeing to make sure that the mentally unstable and that people with violent records uh, should be, we should know who they are before we just give them a gun. Um, these universal background checks, however, have been held back in Congress and by, by what could be perceived as petty arguments over what exactly is an assault-style weapon, what exactly should be the result of a background check and what shouldn't. Um, so 90% of Americans uh, favor background checks, while dramatically fewer people in Congress do. And this really suggests a heavy degree of lobbying on behalf of uh, weapons manufacturers and those uh, those who uh, work closely with weapons fact manufacturers, some of those people being the NRA, some of those people being other groups. And, um, and it, this is an area to put it gently an area of great interest to uh, sociologists as to how this may change in the not too distant future. Uh, an assault style weapon to is the, it, what exactly constitutes an assault style weapon? Um, it's largely cosmetic. Uh, a lot of it has to do with looking like the kind of weapon that someone in the military would use. Uh, the major factor in being quote unquote assault style is high magazine capacity and the number of rounds per second that can be fired. Uh, a folding stock, which a, a folding stock uh, allows for greater um, accuracy and pistol grip also allows for greater accuracy. Uh, but it's a lot of it is that high high capacity magazine. So holding a lot of bullets and being able to shoot a lot of people very quickly, 
that is the defining feature of assault style weapons. And a lot of arguments get um, bogged down by trivialities such as regarding AR-15s, people saying, yeah, we have to ban AR-15s because AR stands for assault rifle. And then other people say, you don't know what you're talking about. It, actually, it's an Armalite rifle. Who cares? It's, it's, it's still a gun that fires a lot of bullets. And that's really what a lot of it comes down to. And how, what are the rules we should set down for guns that fire a lot of bullets very quickly? And who should be allowed to have them and who shouldn't be allowed to have them that as as a society that's what we need to focus on um and we need to really have these conversations too we need to just stop dancing around them it's it's a you know you probably go to school on a campus right and campuses are uh targets of gun violence so um this really impacts you whether you think it does or not there are legal precedents, uh, many legal precedents surrounding uh, gun control. Uh, the District of Columbia v. Heller in 2008 interpreted the Second Amendment to apply to individuals' right to possess and carry weapons uh, in uh, case of confrontation. What does that mean? Uh, basically, uh, if you think that you might be confronted uh, with physical violence, then effectively uh, DC v. Heller says that you should be allowed to carry a gun. Uh, the Second Amendment, you know, we are aware of the Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. Um, that does, but the question is, uh, with the Second Amendment, it says, uh, so that we may, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the, it right in my head the direct quote, but so that me, we may re regulate a militia, we need to have citizens' right to bear arms. Um, we don't really have militias anymore, so is this out of date, right? Or were they putting that, was that just a justification? Was that, was that the writers of the uh, Constitution and the Bill of Rights saying, well, we need to be able to have guns, and one of the good reasons we need to have guns is to have a militia, but really what they're talking about is we need to be able to have guns, right? Those are two different interpretations. There are people saying no militias, we don't need guns anymore. There are people saying, well, we need to be able to have guns no matter what. Um, these, a lot of it comes down to crime control model v. due process model that we talked about earlier in the course. So individuals who interpret the Supreme, oh, Supreme Court should be capitalized there, sorry about that. Those who interpret the Supreme Court decision to mean individuals have a constitutional right to possess any uh, type of firearm and that our right to hold any type of firearm is more important than public safety. Uh, or the due process model, these advocate that due process has to be followed when doling out punishment. Uh, thus, we need crime control uh, over uh, just shooting people, right? So uh, what does, uh, how can we control guns? How can we make that happen? It's effectively what's saying there. Now let's talk about right to privacy, which is another constitutional law issue, but maybe something that we are paying less attention to as a society because we do pay so much attention to guns. So according to the Fourth Amendment, this is also a Bill of Rights and a Constitution issue, uh, American citizens are protected from what is known as unwarranted search and seizure. And we all did, we addressed this earlier in the course as well. Um, unwarranted search and seizure is commonly interpreted to mean that citizens have a right to private communications and to not have their possessions searched by authorities without a legal warrant. Um, effectively, cops can't look through their stu your stuff every time they want to. And what exactly is warranted? Well, a warrant, the piece of paper police have when they come to search your house, must have probable cause. Probable cause, probable cause, sorry, said that weird, uh, means that police must have a legally justified reason to search your premise. They have to be looking for something specific, right? They have to suspect a specific crime and be looking for a specific object or types of objects, right? If they suspect you of murder, 
they have to say, yeah, we think that they did this with, that, that we think that there was a murder weapon. And it's a stronger warrant if they say, well, we know this murder weapon was a knife that was approximately seven inches long, right? Yeah. We can, and we, we can do that. Uh, we can, that's, that's legally where police can enter your home. Uh, what police can't do is just say, yeah, I just want to search your house to see if you're doing anything bad, right? That, that's, not, that's not a legal warrant, right? Uh, now, police do um, say, hey, can I just come in for a minute? Uh, you don't ha if that would ever happen to you, you don't have to let them in. You don't have to let police in your house. Um, it might, you know, it might smooth over the situation with them a little bit, but you're right. Uh, it, as not only a, an American citizen, but as someone uh, living in the country, regardless of citizenship status, is that you don't have to um, tell police anything other than your name and your address, and you don't have to let them in your house. Um, and anything other than that is against the law. Now, in order for a search to be considered unreasonable, then we do have reasonable, reasonable, unreasonable, an individual must have an expressed expectation of privacy, and that expectation must be reasonable. Our definitions of expectation of privacy is changing as technology is changing. Um, it was once considered uh, reasonable to um, think that none of our conversations could ever be recorded unless there's a tape recorder sitting right in front of us. Well, I am recording uh, these words right now, and there is a very, and I'm also using, uh, at this moment, I'm using YouTube to get that out and out to you. Any number of people could, could listen to any of this. They don't have to be in my class. They don't have to be my students. They could just be people leafing through YouTube. Uh, but so I don't have a uh, expectation of privacy regard to this lecture, for example. Um, relevant rulings in this regard was Katz v. the United States in 1967. Uh, in Katz, uh, law enforcement uh, was found to be restricted in terms of wiretapping for investigative purposes. And uh, in order to wiretap, so in order to record people's telephone messages, uh, it was determined that there had to be a warrant. Uh, that changed in 2001 with the USA Patriot Act after 9-11. Uh, the Patriot Act gave uh, much broader definitions of what was necessary for wiretapping and other types of electronic surveillance. Um, and now in the modern era, we have to be much more careful regarding what we want to and what we don't want to and how we can be monitored. And um, given technology, we I could list ways that we are being monitored, but I, it would be incomplete because you know I'm not an expert in the field either. I'm not sure of all the ways that we're being monitored on our computers right now. So this works into technological issues. Uh, each new generation must adapt to the norms of their societies to match the technology that becomes common in that generation. This is called technological determinism, or that's a principle here, is that technology shapes the social world we live in and how we interact with our world. So via technological determinism, your life is much different than your parents' life was at your age and much, much different than your grandparents, right? Via technological determinism, I was able to text my, my mother this morning about a very um, inconsequential matter. Uh, in the mid-1990s, that wouldn't have been possible. We didn't have text messaging. And since I live in Ohio and she lives in Pennsylvania, to tell her anything, I would have had to pay a couple dollars for a long-distance call. That's that's a big difference. Uh, one, one last thing here. Uh, additionally, with technological determinism, um, we need to figure out what is our right to privacy, to go back to that Fourth Amendment thing, right? Like, how much privacy can we give people? Uh, that also plays in here. Okay, talk about drones. Drones being defined as unmanned aerial vehicles, 
that are remote controlled that have rep recording capacity on them. Uh, they, in all likelihood, given our current technology, probably aren't a matter of artificial intelligence. They are probably uh, what is used or what could come up, um, you know, remote control guys, right? Uh, in the United States v. Jones in 2012, it was determined that long-term tracking constitutes a search and requires a warrant due to the amount of information that could potentially be collected via um, unmanned aerial drones. Thus, uh, police and other uh, federal and local and law enforcement bodies cannot just drive drones over your property for extended period of times just because it is open airspace. Uh, you have less rights for your property for the, the air above your property than you do for the actual land itself um, that without this ruling could be exploited by, uh, by law enforcement that wanted to um, search your property. Uh, U.S. v. Jones says that, no, they can't do that. They, they do also need a warrant for that, which is, you know, it's, it's good for most things. Uh, additionally, DNA. We don't often think of DNA as technology or our bodies as grounds for technology, but it's, it's very real. Um, DNA testing and DA, DNA databases, such as things like 23andMe, have recently been used to solve high-profile crime. Now, actually, 20, 23andMe wasn't actually the company that was involved with finding the Golden State Killer. That was actually a public database. But it does raise the question, well, what are your rights to privacy regarding DNA? Um, nobody is making you submit your DNA to these things. Uh, but how much of your DNA do you have the right to control if someone like your cousin submits to uh, 23andMe? Um, and then if your cousin does submit, there's a slight typo in the slide, uh, then you know you are 25% similar to your cousin. You are 50% similar to your sibling, your, your blood sibling anyway. Um, where is, do you have a right to privacy there? If you do submit your DNA to something like 23andMe so that you can learn more about your ancestry, and then that is um, used to uh, put you on trial for a rape that you didn't commit, is there an expectation of privacy there because you did willingly submit it? These are interesting questions. In Maryland v. King in 2012, it was determined that if DNA can be collected for the purposes of linking a suspect to other crimes, um, that it can be done, right? That basically, if DNA is collected from a suspect, then um, we can run that DNA as much as we want and as often as we want and we can use it as much as we can. Um, and that definitely brings up some questions regarding, uh, not necessarily double jeopardy, but regarding, um, you know, well, we didn't get you for this crime, let's see if we can get you for this crime, right? Uh, very much a situation like we saw in uh, the Making a Murderer uh, series that was popular on Netflix a while ago. Okay, that is it for this emerging issues lecture. There definitely are other mish issues, uh, but this is the big one, right? These are the big ones. Um, if you have any questions in this last portion of the course, as with the entire course, please let me know. And um, I look forward to working with you to end out this course. Bye.